So for years, I followed the supercomputer races the same way my friends are following the Knicks and the Lakers, right? I mean, of course, I always cheered whenever a U.S. company would jump out in front. Then I would be really worried and afraid, even angry, if Japan or China took the lead. Lurking now in the backdrop, however, is quantum computing, folks, which could one day make this whole supercomputer race irrelevant. Check this out. This is from IBM. And they talk about the fact that the, the, the advantages of quantum physics fully realized would be able to process massively complicated problems of order of magnitude faster than modern machines. I mean, this is just absolutely amazing. Of course, skeptics of quantum computing point out that there are certain issues we have to worry about, like physics, right, and the laws around the three states of matter. You remember the three states of matter. They're right there on the screen, solids, gases, and liquids. Well, it looks like the laws of matter may have changed. In a breathtaking post yesterday, the CEO of Microsoft celebrating what they call a new state of manner, topo conductors, which now they say will enable a fundamental leap in computing. That's because in the bottom of this is really the most important part. The qubits created with topo, with the topo uh, conductors are faster, more reliable, and smaller. It actually reminds me of the introduction to one of my favorite TV shows, the 1950s Superman. Take a look. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. All right, joining me now is City University of New York professor of theoretical physics and author of Quantum Supremacy, Dr. Michio Kaku. Michio, is this the Superman moment we've been waiting for? This is a game changer. Everything we know about digital computers is going to go out the window in the coming years. Already, the CIA, the Russians, the Chinese, uh, American industry, everyone is looking at this new development. We made a giant step toward creating a quantum computer, which many people thought we would never see. And now we can see it in the laboratory. You know, of course, you've been at the forefront of this. Uh, there's so many quotes I have, but one I want to share with the audience that you made. Quantum computers, in principle, are infinitely more powerful than digital computers that may compute zeros and ones, zeros and ones, because quantum computers are quantum mechanical, right? And that an atom can be split in any direction. How many directions are there? An infinite number of directions. I mean, it sounds mind-boggling, to, to be quite honest with you, and hard to get our hands around. How, do we, how does this look in practice? In practice, it means that what is sitting on your desktop could be a museum piece. Now, we're not there yet. The, Microsoft has been able to create a quantum computer with eight qubits. When we hit maybe a million qubits, watch out. Wow. At that point, you realize you'll be able to break into any known digital code. Think about that. All the codes that we use to guard our secrets can be broken. Nations have to worry about this. Banks, of course, have to worry about this. But we can also break the code of nature, cancer, heart disease. All the things that are confronting us will be able to crack because Mother Nature, in some sense, is a quantum computer. So, so having said that, um, guardrails. It sounds like there should be guardrails. Can there be guardrails? And who would be in charge of the guardrails? Well, already the U.S. government has set up a study group looking at the possibilities of when, not if, but when we have quantum computers, how will we protect our bank accounts, our savings, our nuclear codes? How are we going to protect that? And so already the federal government is in on this. They realize it is coming, coming faster than you realize. So this will not only change the way we live, the way we view disease, the way we view warfare, it'll also change your pocketbook as well. So I know the countdown has gotten shorter. The timeline has certainly got a lot shorter than just a few months ago. Um, as we wait, 2025 is also said to be the year of humanoid robots. You've written a lot about this. They're coming on strong. How does that uh, fit into to the world where I think it was Isaac Asimov who once said, listen, robots, AI, those kind of things are amazing because they will free people up to use more of their brains. Can it really be that impact, positively impactful to a society that's used to people doing things, actually achieving things with their own hands and their own minds? Well, I think that science fiction writers have done a great job of scaring the pants off people. <laughs> Realize that robots that can do mechanical work, 
are still far, far in the distance. Uh, look at the workplace. We don't have we don't have robots picking up garbage. We don't have robots designing uh, buildings and, and creating new structures. No, we have robots that can barely talk and barely see what's happening. So we have a long ways to go before we can mimic Mother Nature to create a human counterpart to us. Well, Dr. Michio Kaku, I want to say um, your work has many of us dreaming and thinking about this stuff, and it is amazing to be alive as it comes to fruition or we get closer. And I just want to thank you for everything that you've written about and for coming on the show today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty. See you soon.